I'm going to try to do this with a mic there. Hopefully you can still hear me. Uh, if you look back, can you hear me? Oh. <laughs> oh, I might have to pick it up. Okay. Uh, better? Yeah. Excellent. Hang on. There we go. Okay. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, what's inside that container. Um, hopefully related to software containers rather than anything else. Uh, first up, uh, as Chris kindly introduced me, I'm uh, Gareth. I'm basically Gareth R pretty much everywhere on the internet. Uh, someone was saying, like, they're wondering if this like, looks like me. You can answer that question yourselves. Um, I work for Puppet. Uh, um, so I've been there for a few years. Um, so I've been, I've been, I guess, part of this wider community for longer than that, too. Um, I'm going to talk a little... There'll be a few bits that are relevant to Puppet, but this isn't really a Puppet talk. But if anyone does want to talk Puppet and containers, come and find me later on. Um, so, what am I going to try and cover in this talk? Uh, I'm going to talk about what is configuration management uh, because I'm going to disagree with John a little bit and I think it's useful background and hopefully it's not just repetition of things that people have said before. Uh, I'm going to talk about Docker base image usage um, as a proxy for what's going on with, con with uh, basically containers. Um, I have a lot of data from the internet, uh, not all of it happy. Um, I'm going to talk about the problems that come from treating containers as black boxes. Um, I'll talk about why we have that mental model, why we do think of containers as black boxes sometimes. Um, but I'll talk about what the problems, especially for operators, that come from that. And I've got a bunch of demos, uh, hopefully that I'll have time to demo, or I've got slides if I need them, uh, if the demos don't work for whatever reason. Um, and some ideas and thoughts that I will hopefully leave you with afterwards. So. I say, fit, fitting for configuration management camp, you've come to an event uh, about an, a, a sort of an area, a discipline that you obviously know something about. You came along, uh, and I'm going to tell you what it is. Uh, but most people were probably not expecting me to start in the 1950s research, unless you were in one of my previous talks where I have a habit of doing weird things like that. Um, who's read these documents? Someone's got a hand up, uh, but nearly no one else has. I, I, these are not the type of thing around configuration management that we normally talk about in this community. But this is actually where a, a lot of our language comes from. Um, this is basically not, pretty much sort of 50s, 60s, 70s uh, research, mainly US military basis. Um, a lot of it to do with nuclear weapons originally, uh, or nuclear weapons sort of silos. Um, but there's some bits and pieces in there that I think get down to the essence of what I think configuration management is. Um, and the ideas around sort of identification control, status accounting, verification and audit as the fundamental problems that we're trying to solve when we talk about configuration management, I think is a good way of thinking about it. Um, a couple of sort of like direct sort of like quotes from those. So, configuration management verifies that a system is identified and documented in sufficient detail. Uh, configuration management verifies that a system performs as intended. Um, this is where I sort of, I, I think, like, this, this to me is the essence of configuration management, not the more reductive, um, I came at it from a tool's point of view and packages and services and other bits and pieces. It's not that they're not part of the like, solutions to some of those problems, it's just that they're implementation details. Um, so for me, configuration management isn't a tool. Um, I think you can say configuration management tool, but if you say I use configuration management to do X, I, I get like, I, I, I think it's wrong. Um, but not, not that people will stop. But that's, that is really context for like why what I want to talk about is to me configuration management. Um, so, I'd say coming to software containers um, and Docker base images in particular. Um, I'm sort of assuming a whole bunch of familiarity with that sort of, well, the c containers and to a degree with Docker. Um, I'll try and sort of d dig into details where it's useful. Um, I think it, what I wanted to do with sort of the research behind this was really look at what people are actually doing with containers. And there's a lot of people who aren't using containers yet. There's a lot of people who are. There's a lot of people who are 
coming at it purely again from the software side, their introduction of containers is Docker or it's Kubernetes as opposed to a higher level sort of set of problems or, or solutions. Um, so what people are doing is sort of, I think, indicative of the types of problems that we're going to have in production as this sort of, scale, this sort of movement scales. Uh, so the Docker Hub um, is basically a central repository of, uh, by, at this point, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of images that people have uploaded. Uh, it exposes a lot of that data through a nice API. So I went spelunking to see, well, what, are the, what images are people downloading? Um, Hopefully the table is big enough. Actually, it's a huge screen. It's definitely big enough. Um, so this was data from Docker Hub about the download counts um, up to a few days ago um, for, in this case, uh, containers that are specifically referencing operating systems. Um, I'll come back to why that's sort of interesting in a moment. Uh, so you see, I mean, like, these numbers are huge. We're talking about hundreds of millions in some cases. Um, but the distribution is interesting as well. So that was that sort of like the operating system containers. Um, and lots of people are like, don't put entire operating system file systems inside your containers, stop it. Um, I guess partly my point is with the data that I was looking for is like, people are doing it, tough. Whether it's a good idea or not, that is the default for everything anyone, everyone was doing in the containers. Even the actual, uh, language sort of centered sort of base images. People saying, well, oh no, I'm, but I'm not, I'm not doing from Ubuntu, that's a bad idea. I'm doing from Go or from Java or whatever, the other official sort of language container of choices. They're all based on Debian anyway. Uh, so actually the Debian number here is massively larger because of, like actually that should be, that would be a lot higher if you factored in all of the others. Um, Ubuntu is already incredibly high uh, sort of interesting. Um, one of the things that people get cross about on the internet about base images and containers in general is, is the sort of the size of that thing. And I think it's, it's interesting to have a look at those, the sizes. Um, partly because a lot this has actually dropped in response to the internet wanting it to be smaller. Um, so yes, BusyBox is a meg, and yes, Alpine is four meg, but actually, um, Debian and most of the others are now hovering over like just over a hundred, whereas I think originally that was sort of three, four hundred. Um, so consider here that we're talking about your application, which might be a few meg, carrying around a dependency chain which is a hundred meg. Um, how so you've got that sort of disconnect between the code you're writing. Um, and you, that you're putting inside your container, your mental model of your application, and this 120, 130 meg sort of dependency tree that you're sort of carrying around that you might not even think about. Um, I think that sort of will lead to some operational problems that I'll come on to later. Um, like, what's the size of that? How, how many, uh, I got the, uh, yes, I have it yet. Um, like, and how many files is that? Um, uh, how many packages are in there? Um, the answer is basically loads, apart from Alpine, really. Um, again, like the, the Fedora image ha has 164 packages and like 20, more than 20,000 files. That's the, th that's the thing you're going to carry around in order for your application to work on top of it. Um, and the idea that that's just sort of magic and you don't have to care about worries me quite a bit. Um, but like, look, going to look for more data about, and that's downloads. Maybe people are actually doing different things, though, um, elsewhere. So uh, uh, this chap, um, David Gaudio, wrote a whole bunch of uh, bits about how, getting Docker uh, file content from git, the GitHub index in BigQuery. Uh, BigQuery from Google, uh, I have a public index of everything that goes on in GitHub, and you can query it with SQL. It's absolutely my favorite hammer at the moment. Uh, so we can write queries like this, uh, which is sequ sort of SQL honest, um, where we're iterating over all of the, Git the Docker file content I built an index of, um, and pulling out the from line um, and doing some splunging in there as well. 
Uh, and we can look at the popularity on GitHub of, uh, of those images in those public Docker files. Um, and again, this follows a similar distribution to the one we saw before. Um, Ubuntu is actually well out in front. Uh, Debian sort of the, uh, is, ne is definitely next up. Um, and you've got a lot, you've got, a, you do have a long tail here, but actually the operating system containers for the most part amount to the top 50% of what people are doing. Um, and bearing in mind that Java and Python and Node and the others are actually all carrying around Debian, um, the vast majority of these containers, based on all, all the, the data sets that I'm finding, are carrying around entire operating system file systems inside them. Uh, interesting to note the growth there as well. Um, I just did a sort of sample of those. Uh, there's sort of a, and this was between August and January, so a good few months, but not huge. You're sort of seeing a constant 10% type thing. Uh, Busybox loses out. Alpine is growing massively faster, but from a really small base. Um, obviously, that's just cannibalizing the Busybox stuff. Uh, interestingly, CentOS was growing like nearly twice the rate of the sort of Debian bits, but again, from a lower base. Uh, more data. Um, really sort of trying to like a uh, couple of data sets can we have more data sets that back this up um, the folks at micro badger who basically have a um, an index of a load of the content on github um, that they then provide sort of services around to uh, have a look at micro badger if you've not if you're doing things with the containers um, but from their sample again playing out the same sort of thing uh, ubuntu well out ahead. The official images, which are Debian, plus Debian being up there. Um, they see slightly more Alpine um, things, I think partly down to the, commu their, the community around that tool. Um, and I did a survey on the internet as well um, in a wholly unscientific manner. Um, but 275 uh, data points, and, and again you see a similar theme, sort of, well yeah, some people are doing scratch things, but really not many. Um, Debian and Ubuntu, well out in front. I think there's, again, like Alpine Busybox is probably over-reporting a little bit here um, based on the fact that I asked this question. Depending on where you ask that question from, you'd probably get a slightly different answer. Um, so that's a lot of data. Um, and I think it points to sort of a few things that then lead to some problems that then lead to so hopefully some solutions is the sort of thread of this talk. And the majority of people using Docker are using images containing an entire operating file system. Um, and you can argue uh, stop doing that, um, but honestly, that's what the internet is doing, and it's probably going to continue doing so, um, which I know is going to upset some people in particular. Um, Alpine usage is growing, I mentioned, but it's starting from a much smaller base. Um, so uh, Scratch or other approaches like Nix, uh, like they have a, like they exist, but they have a small niche. And that I think is sort of interesting because I think a lot of people, um, their perception is, oh, everyone's doing Alpine, or, or of course you're just doing Scratch things. The reality is most people are not. Most people are using full operating systems. They're using PHP. They're using Java. Um, it's not all go binaries. Some of these things, I think, for this community are yes, of course. But actually, if you go to more of the container events, the, the idea that like, the real world is doing these things that like, are wrong from a certain point of view is definitely like heresy. Um, I, didn't, I, mean, I didn't find a lot of evidence around sort of Windows containers and, and nano images. Um, I, I think that's because it's too new. Uh, but I think undoubtedly over the next like, year or so, we'll see a big increase in uh, Windows containers, I would imagine. Um, and one other observation as well, I mean, between Debian, between Ubuntu, um, between the uh, current official images, that I think some of them are moving uh, more towards Alpine, like the Debian derivatives account for the majority of file systems inside containers today. Um, I would hate to hazard a guess at like, just the sheer file size of the number of copies of Debian uh, that are now like in all of these container clusters, um, but it's considerable. Uh, there's probably an environmental issue there as well. Like, how much of the world's data size is actually just multiple copies of Debian? Um, so, if you buy, well, that's what's happening. 
we are carrying around like billions of copies, broadly speaking, of the, Deb of the Debian distro uh, on all of our computers everywhere. I, why is that bad? Why, like, what, what do I, like, uh, is that a problem? Um, I think there are some problems that come out of that, and, I, and it's not just me that thinks there are some problems, and there's a number of sort of posts on the internet, um, so I, and I won't go into too much of these. But like, and do you know what's inside your container? Like, just saying, oh, Ubuntu isn't really a good enough answer from a, an operating point of view, from a like security point of view, from a compliance point of view, from a lot of other sort of like prob higher level problems that need better data to solve them. Um, and sort of that, that concept of visibility, um, that sort of is part of that, like that sort of definition I was using of configuration management. Like how visible are your, uh, is what's inside your container? Um, can you even ask those questions of it in the same ways you would probably expect to do so uh, if, you're if you're managing your infrastructure today with the sort of configuration management tools that we're talking about at this event. Um, what, you, I mean, like the sort of what you don't know can hurt you. Um, you can say, well, oh, I don't know, I don't care, and then something like Heartbleed comes along and suddenly like, someone somewhere else is very much going to care. Um, that sort of, like, that challenge to that sort of Oh no, it's it's a black box. It's fine, um, until it's not. Because actually, there's a lot of stuff inside that black box. Um, we saw a whole uh, sort of, of posts around sort of vulnerable images on Docker Hub, um, and I, there were some sort of statistics and people doing reports and sort of over 30% of official images on Docker Hub of high priority vulnerabilities and a whole bunch of other things that were verging on FUD a little bit. I and mean, ultimately, it's not. It isn't that simple. Um, and there are lots of reasons for software to be sort of frozen in time, but then new versions created and you should be using the newer versions. And old vulnerable software doesn't often die anywhere near as quickly as we would like. Uh, there's some wholly terrifying numbers around uh, like the, the Maven repository, around the number of times people download and like known compromised versions of crypto libraries. Uh, it's, like that, that's a sort of a broad configuration management problem. Um, the question is, containers could, well, one of the points is containers could be an avenue for us to improve that. Um, based on what's happening, we're probably making it co worse collectively than better. And I guess a, go a good question, and I've, I've spent a bit of time asking this to a number of people, um, often with like a look of sort of horror on their face when they realize Ah, no, not like, the, like there's probably a spreadsheet and like all of our interns involved to answer this sort of thing. Like, can you tell me all the versions of OpenSSL you have in production right now? And I think, again, like moving to containers um, changes the game enough that a question that actually you probably have very much in hand in a sort of mature um, operating environment suddenly disappears down a rabbit hole. Um, and I'm picking on OpenSSL um, because, like, why wouldn't you? But it's true of any of the sort of hype, like, sort of versions of software that sometimes, for whatever external reason, suddenly you have to answer questions like this. Um, and containers are a black box, and to lots of people, um, they're often positioned as that. That's that's pushed as a strength. Um, what I'd argue that is, is that containers are a black box from the point of view of the scheduler. That's the strength. From the point of view of whether it's Swarm or Kubernetes or Mesos or anything else that's running that container, um, that, uh, uh, it being a black box, that's the point. That's what gives the schedulers those, the power to say, like, I can run anything. D like, give me something that adheres to this specification and I can run it. And given that simplifying assumption, I can then move on to doing things like auto-scaling bits and pieces or uh, like optimizing for utilization or whatever you want your schedulers algorithms to do. Containers are a black box from that point of view. And I think a lot of the container conversations are driven from the point of view of the scheduler and the people writing the schedulers. 
Um, there are an awful lot of people working on Kubernetes and on Docker and it, within those respective communities. And all of that is really being driven by scheduler concerns. And I think that's where we get this, containers are a black box. But I'd argue containers are not a black box from the point of view of the operator, given that we're putting up like hundreds of meg inside everyone at a moment in time. Um, at any point, any of those components could have vulnerabilities. And if we don't, if, if no one pays attention to that, that becomes a bit of a ticking time bomb. Um, good news from the point of view of, I guess, this, in, this crowd, this environment, I think I, I, I see these as genuine, genuine, general configuration management problems. And I think it is all about identification, uh, like status accounting, verification. Like it is about us knowing what we have and in some cases being able to manage what we have. But management comes only from visibility, I think. So I think like, that these are problems. There aren't actually necessarily like solutions that are not, per like there, there, are, there are perfect solutions, um, but actually that's not what the, that's not what the majority are doing. Um, you can argue, oh, everything's a scratch container. Uh, you can, that's not what people are doing. Um, I think it's not got what people are going to do for a very long time. So there's a gap there that I think we need to fill. Um, I've got a bunch of sort of thoughts. I've, I've got some uh, demos that I will uh, show as well. And touching on part of it that, like, again, like, can be used as a simplifying cons uh, sort of assumption with some of the tools that change how, I guess, we might have solved these problems previously. Um, is that concept of containers being immutable. Because um, immutability at the container level means we just need to know what we put inside the box. Yeah, it's, it's, still, it's a black box from the point of view of the scheduler. Um, from the operator's point of view, if we know what we put in and we have immutability guarantees, we know what's in there. Um, I'm not going to rant here, um, but I have done previously uh, with like big flashing red slides. I, one of the things is containers are not immutable by default, at least in the sort of Docker implementation of this, which is by far and away the majority. Um, the number of people who this has shocked uh, is too large for like my sanity. Um, a lot of people conflate like containers and immutable infrastructure. Um, containers can be used to build immutable infrastructures. Um, but actually, it's to do with file systems, not containers. With, read, like with Docker, you can pass the read-only flag. Unless you're actually opting into immutability, your containers are mutable. Um, lots of people panic and then pass the read-only flag and then find their applications don't work. Because they, I, like, especially sort of, I guess, some of the web frameworks, things like Rails and others, there's often a whole bunch of assumptions about, of course, I can, of course there's a file system that I can write to. Um, it's, like, if, you're not, if you are using containers and you're not using read-only ones, like, you should be doing. However, that doesn't necessarily come for free. Um, so there's a slight tangent about immutability, but I think building tools for that immutable pattern is, is the, some of the bits where we're missing. It's not enough to say, oh, no, like, I, 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 like, it's fine. I, like, I know what's in, inside that container. It's Ubuntu 16.04. Um, that's not enough. And ultimately, you can't answer questions there like the sort of actually at the package level where the actual TVs are happening. This is, mute, this is transient. Um, Ubuntu 16.04 today isn't Ubuntu 16.04 tomorrow, potentially. You'll, like those upstream images are changing all the time. Um, that also will only pull from upstream if uh, you don't already have it. So you might have your own entire local set of versions of that. You've also got without, uh, if you're not using all of the sort of basically uh, like content trust and signing verification bits pieces, and even then I think you can work around them. Um, that's just arbitrary text. I could build a CentOS image and call it, uh, basically tag it Ubuntu and tag it 16.04 and someone saying, oh, it's coming from this string is totally, lo it's local, transient, and arbitrary. Um, so anyone who says that's like, oh, it's fine, I know what's in my containers, I have, I know the from lines, um, is in for a bad time. 
I'll say, I'm going to, I'll do some demos and see how they go. Um, yeah, I've got enough time. How much time have I got? Excellent. Um, let's see if I can make, hopefully that's near enough. So. Okay. So, oh, I'll try and. Oh. Oh. Hopefully that's good. Nope. nope. Hello, testing. There's nothing on your screen. Uh, yep. That's how I can hear you. Oops. One second. Oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. Um, so, um, I've got Docker. Run I've got Docker running. I've got a whole bunch of images. I've got no containers running. Um, so far, so good. Um, I've got a script called uh, add container inventory. Um, and so I'm going to run that. I'm going to run that again. So I'm, I'm passing a couple of arguments. Uh, I'm passing Debian as the first one. I'm passing uh, Gareth R slash Debian slash uh, inventory as the second one. Uh, the first one is the name of an image I have in my local repository. Uh, the second is a, n a new name for an image I'm going to create. Uh, so we'll give that a moment to run. Um, so I'm creating a new image f off the pa previous one. Uh, but the new one is going to have some superpowers. So give that a moment. There we go. So, let's run, um, that'll do. So I, I've I've booted a, a, a version of that container, um, uh, the image that I just created. I just jumped into a bash shell. Um, actually, first let's do something else. Um, I could do, no, it's not okay. Inspect. Um, oh, I forgot what it is. Uh, do do so. Right, so I've got a bash shell. Um, one of the things that would stand out if people could see the text is that there's this inventory.json file in there um, that has loads of data. That's not very useful. Oops. Um, but that's, we've added a new layer to the image um, on top of the existing Debian uh, ones with just that file added. Um, so let's so here I'm sort of simulating grabbing that file by running a new container and dumping it out to JQ. Um, and you can see the type of like we've got all sorts of information in here about the operating system. Well, actually, let's query dot uh, So JQ, for those that haven't seen it, is basically a, a JSON parsing command line said like thing. So all I'm doing there is basically I'm running the container, uh, I'm loading in the inventory file and grabbing out the OS. Um, the interesting thing there is that I can do that from outside the container. 
I can do that in a standard way, like from like irrespective of the underlying operating system. I'm not having to log in and know what the operating system is, working out by fiddling around with files. Um, so we've built a standard API for asking questions, in this case about the operating system. Um, and we've done that just by running the script to, to add new layers to images. So it's very ex like extendable. Um, but the, the image itself is now carrying that information. So if the image changes, um, again, you're, if you're running them in a mutable ma manner, Docker diff will tell you that the inventory is dirty and you can regenerate it. Um, you can imagine like, tying all of those pieces together into, a, like, into your pipeline. Um, so. So we've added, I said, the script's online. Um, people can play around with that. We can, we can grab these inventories. It's just a load of data. Um, but it's data in a standard way that is not, you, don't, you no longer need to know what the operating system is inside to know how to ask it questions. Um, and it will work across different operating systems. This is sort of similar to I mean, whether it's Puppet or Chef or Ansible, providing those high level abstractions. Um, we're providing a single way of doing something. In this case, we're querying data. It's more about visibility than control. Um, given we have that inventory, like what sort of useful things can we do? Because that's the implementation details. Like, why is that useful? Um, well, we can ask that black box what operating system it contains. Uh, that's surprisingly interesting because actually most people don't. They'll just go, oh, we have a lot of containers we're running. Um, it's a black box. It's whatever the developer happened to put in there. Those containers may come from third parties. Um, understanding your exposure starts with understanding what, like, with what you have. Um, but that's not super interesting, but, and I've just shown that anyway. Um, but we can do more interesting, solve more interesting problems. Um, what about building a package search engine? So let's go play around with something. Uh, so I said, I, I, I didn't have any um, Let's just, I've got something running. Okay. So I don't have any containers running, um, but let's start a bunch up. So I, I'm using uh, Compose just for uh, sort of speed of booting a bunch of containers. The Compose file uh, just has uh, some services, uh, one called Debian, one called OpenSUSE, one called Ubuntu, one called CentOS, that just put a whole bunch of operating systems containers into sleep. I'm just doing that for demo purposes. In your example, it would be whatever your actual infrastructure was. Um, let's, let's scale some of them so we've got a few more containers. I'm really just sort of seeding data here. There we go. So I've now got a whole bunch of containers running. Um, and I have in the background, yeah, here we go, uh, uh, basically uh, uh, something that is indexing those inventory files from all of the containers that are running. Uh, so there's, like, there's magic happening in the background. Oops. Uh, that's not very interesting. Um, it's, what's interesting is what we can do with that data. So uh, what packages might people be interested in? Said. Oh, oops. Um, oh, have I broken something now? Oh. Uh, oh, I think I'm waiting for the indexer to kick in. Come on. Oh. Let me restart this. I, don't, I said these are very much prototypes.
Uh, I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, so I've got some slides in case it didn't work. Um, so we can search that inventory um, and whether using a command line tool um, or actually there's a simple web UI as well. Uh, and again, these are prototypes, but it's already sort of uh, like proving useful, I think. Um, we can reveal data. We can reveal actually variability uh, the sort of the stripy colored thing is an indicator of how, uh, in, in this case, uh, system D, I, how consistent is our infrastructure when it comes to the version of, in this case, I say, in this case, system D. Um, actually, it, and here we, it looks like we're running five different versions, um, fairly evenly distributed. Um, we know that consistency is a good idea from a, well, from a secure, security point of view, from a, application consistency point of view. Um, actually, understanding the variability of the containers can have an interesting effect. Um, we can start answering questions like, how many versions of OpenSSL are we running? Um, where have we not patched things? Uh, I've been doing a bunch of work of uh, actually exporting this into BigQuery um, and uh, building indexes from there. But we can do things built on top of that as well. Let's see if my Let's go see if this is working now. Ah, uh, no, I've definitely broken it. Um, we can augment that information with external sources of data. So checking containers for CVEs is actually sort of a non-trivial problem. Um, the Red Hat Security Data API is sort of a good source of that data. There are a whole bunch of others for different operating systems. Uh, for, like, the Red Hat one actually is just really nice, as opposed to not all of the others. Um, but building tools like this, where we can scan containers for CVEs based on knowing like, what's actually running inside them, having an interface to talk to them, and having access to the CVE information. Uh, and it's quite surprising how many like, uh, sort of uh, packages with CVEs you find inside those containers. Um, and again, like this is, I think, in lots of cases, this is inside the black box. I have no way of knowing these things. And actually starting to expose this information allows us to then like, combat that variability, combat like, the sort of like, CVE sprawl. Um, there's scripts on the internet mainly for the slides sharing later. So, and concluding, really, like, I want to stress that operators treating containers as black boxes is going to end badly. Um, containers as black boxes is the right model from the point of view of the scheduler. If you're running them, you ha like, you, like we, given that we're putting entire file systems inside them, we need to think more about operating them. Uh, beware the difference between the sort of the purity of uh, the sort of scratch container model. And if you read the sort of Google papers, like that's what they do. Is that what you're doing? Because if it's not, you're solving different problems. You're missing different types of tools. But I think they're like, we need to be a lot more pragmatic when it comes to the reality of Docker-based images. Um, when using containers, we need to reconsider solutions that we've previously felt solved. And if you're using one of the configuration management tools that people are talking about here, like Puppet or anything, like you can probably really easily answer the question of how many, ver like, how many different versions of OpenSSL am I running across my infrastructure? Um, like, everything has some sort of search-based query sort of setup. Um, if you're going to put those things inside containers, you need something that addresses the same problems there. OK, and that's me. Done. Thank you. If anyone wants to see the actual working demos as well, just come see me afterwards. I will fix it, whatever I broke. Mm -hmm.